please, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 4. And uh, I'm going to do things a little bit differently today because we're going to read two passages and I'm going to then focus on the second one that we read. Luke chapter number 4, we'll read beginning with verse 23. Let's all stand please as we read God's Word together and we'll reverence God's Word that way. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 4, verse number 23. Luke chapter 4, verse 23. We have just come from, of course, the record of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And then how He came to Nazareth in Galilee. Nazareth was a place where Christ grew up and was raised. And we learned last week of how He preached on the Sabbath days, and He preached in the synagogues. And He used Isaiah chapter 61 to preach that He is fulfilling those things through His ministry. And that the people were amazed and wondered at the gracious words that He spoke. And then we see what our Lord says to those in the synagogue at Nazareth. In Luke chapter 4, and verse 23, He says this, And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. This passage records to us how that He is speaking to those in Nazareth and He tells them that this is the place I grew up, but no prophet is accepted in his own country. In other words, He could go any other place and they would receive Him. He could go any other place and they would listen to Him. But in Nazareth where they knew Him as a child, they would not listen to Him. It's the principle here that's throughout Scripture that many of the prophets were not called to their own families or to their own homeland, but other places, because that's where the Lord would use them. Those that they knew would not listen to them. And he backs up this by giving specific examples in the Old Testament Scriptures. One of a widow that Elijah met, and another of of Naaman, whom Elisha showed how he could be healed. And Jesus specifically tells us how that this widow that Elijah was to help was not of Israel, but was of Sidon, which is a Gentile land, not of Israel. The name and the man that Elisha was to heal was not of Israel, but was of Syria. And he uses this to explain that I know, Jesus says, that you will not receive my sayings. And immediately when these people realize what he's saying, they become angry. And they realize, they perceive that he's speaking about them. And uh, they become very angry and they try to kill him and cast him off the hill. But the Lord just passed through the midst and went his way. And what did he do? He came to Capernaum, the city where many think that his headquarters would be then instituted in the place of Capernaum where people did receive Him. And there the Bible says they were astonished. His word was with power. Those people listened to Him. What I want us to do is, I want us to move, if you will, to the book of 1 Kings. I want us just to see the passage that will be our 
our text for the day. 1 Kings chapter number 17, because this is where we find the story of the widow woman that Elijah meets and that Elijah is going to help. And we see here a powerful story that I believe our Lord wants us to see today. And as I prayed about this and thought about what we would focus on today, the Lord directed me to this passage. It's important for us to understand what Jesus is saying to the scribes and the Pharisees and to those in Nazareth, but He alludes to this powerful story. And I want us just to read a little bit here. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we'll read this and then we'll get to our text. 1 Kings chapter 17, the Bible says in verse number 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, that is Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me there of a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know, that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. I want us to notice here in verse number 16, where the Bible says, that the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. The barrel did not waste, the cruise did not fail. According to the saying, the word of the Lord which He spake by Elijah. This is an amazing story, and much for the taking, and much for us to glean from it. And I want to give you a few things that I pray would be of a great help to us today from this passage. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we come to You now. We're praying that You would bless and use this message in a special way in our lives. I pray You remove distractions from our hearts and our minds now. Cleanse us of any sin. Lord, cleanse our hearts and our minds. We ask that You would prepare us to receive the nuggets of truth that You have for us. I pray, Lord, now that You would take this vessel of clay. May every word that proceeds out of this mouth may be thus saith the Lord. Not the words of man, but the words of God. May You work in our hearts in a special way. And we'll thank You for it. May You guide us now through the message. And we thank You for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we be drawn closer to Him today through what we will hear from the Word of God. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
What a powerful story we have here. It would be impossible for us to say everything that needs to be said. I want to just give you some simple things from the story that I believe will help us. It is helpful to place ourselves in the predicament that this widow was in, who had nothing to give. The widow who had nothing left. In fact, she had two branches she was going to rub together and make a fire and try to bake what she had left, and that was going to be it. She planned to die until the man of God came along and some things changed. Now as we come into this story today, we have just learned, if we have read 1 Kings 17, and verses 1 through 7, that the Lord was sustaining Elijah after he had fled from, Isaiah, uh, from Ahab and Jezebel. And he had come, the Bible says, to the brook Cherith. And there the Lord was sustaining him. And the Bible says that God sent ravens in the morning and ravens at night to give him meat to eat. And then he was to drink water from the brook. And these ravens were to give him not only meat to eat, but bread to eat. And I found consolation in that, that I realized he didn't have any vegetables. And I thought that was interesting. And he had meat to eat, and he had bread. He had some steak, and he had some rolls, amen? <laughs> he had a good meal. And the Bible says in the morning and the evening, he didn't have lunch. I imagine he had plenty in the morning and didn't need lunch. He wasn't doing a whole lot. He is there being sustained by God. By these ravens, the Bible says He was sustaining him. And let me remind all of us today that God always sustains us. He sustains us sometimes in these palpable, tangible, visible, physical ways that we can see. But then sometimes He sustains us in the hard times with spiritual bread to eat. Do you remember how Jesus said when He looked at the tempter, and he won the victory in that battle. He looked at him and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now I didn't intend for this to be the point of the message or the thrust of the message today. But it's important for us to see that God not only provides the physical nourishment that He needs, but the Lord in His own way, in His own timing, and in His own method, the Lord is able to provide the physical and the spiritual bread that we need. Day in and day out. And can I make an application today? I want to make an application as we go right into the story today. I want us to make an application of what we have here at the Brook Cherith. That the truth of the matter is that when He was sustained morning and evening, this is not only an application of the, of the physical sustenance that a person needs, but you and I need to realize that if we're going to have the sustenance that we need spiritually every day, if we're going to have the nourishment that we need every day, that we need the morning nourishment and the evening nourishment. That we need not only the bread and the meat in the morning, just like you get up and eat something for breakfast and before you go to bed at night and you have a dinner and you eat something physically to give the spiritual nourishment that you need in your bodies. The truth of the matter is, as Christians, we also need the spiritual nourishment in the morning when we get up and we need it before we go to sleep at night. People say, oh, I have a hard time with, I go to bed, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that, my mind is going a million miles an hour. I'm thinking about this that happened, I'm worried about this. Well, can I make a suggestion to you? You need to find some spiritual nourishment to feed on before you go to bed. Before you go to sleep at night, and one of the most important decisions I ever made in my life was that before I go to bed at night, I would read something that would help me in a spiritual way. I'm just saying to you today that the application is that we know that we, we need daily bread every day when our Lord says in the model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. But the truth of the matter is, that's not just physical bread, but the spiritual bread that we need. And we need it in the morning, but after that day, that 12, 13, 14, 15 hour day is over, we need to put a, our head on the pillow at night 
And we need to have some spiritual nourishment as the ends of that day, beginning it right, but also it's a very important end it right. Did you know that many people start right? Many people, many preachers, many Christians, many people start right, but they have a hard time finishing well. And maybe we learn how to start the day right, but we need to finish the day well. We need to finish the day by not just the physical bread that we need from the Lord, but the daily bread of the Lord. Not just the physical, but the spiritual. We need that as well. Before we put our head down to repose for the night and get the physical rest, we must have not only the physical, but the spiritual in the morning and at night. We need the physical nourishment and the sustenance that we need. But as we come to the story, we see that he had been at the brook Cherith, but then the Bible says that all the brook dried up. There's nothing left there. There's no more water there. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that the Lord, when one thing dries up, the Lord provides something else. You see that? When the one thing we say, that's not working anymore. I'm not finding what I need. That well has run dry. The Lord opens up a new well. Opens up something new for us to feed on. and Something new for us to drink from. And here we are. He's about to open a well. Verse number 8, And the the word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise, go to Zarephath. And Zarephath is not in Israel. Zarephath is near Zidon, and he said, and Zidon is, is, is up the coast. It's up the coast north of Israel and past Zebulun and Naphtali in that area. And there it is on the coast. It's not, a, it's not an Israeli city. It's not a Jewish habitation, but it's where the Gentiles live. And he said, go there and dwell there. I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. He's commanded this widow woman to take care of of his needs. I want you to notice number one, please, if you will. Uh, write down, please, we see number one, God's plan for Elijah. God's plan to sustain Elijah. We see here God's plan. When we come to this story, we see that when the Lord tells him, I want you to go to Zidon, He's telling him to go to a place that Elijah would not have imagined God would tell him to go. God would have, uh, Elijah would have imagined that God would tell him to go to some city in Israel. Elijah would have imagined that God would have sent him to some place that he was familiar with. He would have imagined that God would tell him to go somewhere where there was people that he knew. But instead, God told Elijah to go to Zidon to be sustained by a widow woman. The first thing I want you to notice, please, is this plan that God had a plan for Elijah. God had a plan. It may have not been His plan, but God had a plan. And it's amazing how God can do things however He wants. He may not use something familiar. He may not use someone familiar. He may not use a place that we think that He will use. And tell us to go. But he says, no, I want you to go somewhere else. I want you to go to Israel, a place you're familiar, and where you know everyone. And there's plenty of widows. That's what the Lord said. There was plenty of widows in Israel that he could have gone. Plenty of widows that could have helped to take care of his needs. But he said, no, I want you to go to Zidon. To a woman who's a widow that probably doesn't know the Lord. I want you to go, and I've commanded her to sustain them. You know, God's plan is amazing because many times we miss God's plan when we try to contrive it our own way. And say, well, I want to go to this place because I'm familiar with it. And I think this is going to happen, this is going to happen, but God many times will take you to Zarephath. God many times will take you, as the Lord called it, the city of Sarepta. God will take you to a place where you didn't imagine will take you to something you didn't imagine God would do, and there He will sustain you. Do you know that by personal way of illustration, I don't plan to say some of these things, but I say them because the Lord is is speaking to me. That I never imagined God would take me to a place called Pennsylvania. And more than that, 
I didn't imagine God would play, take me to a place called Harrisburg. And I remember when I was a kid, and I'm getting off topic, but I'm having a good time, aren't you? And I remember as I had a, as a, as a kid, I had a, I had a map. And what it was was a puzzle. It was a wooden puzzle. Has anyone ever had a puzzle that was the United States of America? Anybody ever had that? Okay. I loved it. And they were all different colors. And we loved putting them all together. And, 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 and just then we would try to look at the capitals. You had to lift up the state and look under it. You remember that? You remember that? You had to lift up the state and look under it for the capitals. And for some reason, I remember I loved that. And as a, as, as a very young boy, I always had an interest in geography. I always had an interest in, I used to make maps, and, and I can prove it to you. I used to make maps, and I used to put the cities on them. I, I used to tell them where things were, and I wasn't always right. But I liked to make maps. I liked to draw them. And I was very interested in that. But I remember, and for some reason, I say for some reason, but we know that there's always a transcendent reason for so many things. But as I remember, I looked at that, and there was one... There was one state that I would look at that and I would say, oh, that's an interesting capital. It's not as popular. It's not like New York City. It's not like, uh, it's not like some big capital like Denver, Colorado, or Austin, Texas, or something big like that. But there's this place called Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's not Philadelphia. Did you know Philadelphia is not the capital of, United States, of, of Pennsylvania? How many of you knew that? That Philadelphia is not the capital? It's not the big city of Philadelphia. It's not the big... Uh, old city of Pittsburgh. It's not these big cities, but there's this little place that's called Harrisburg. That's the capital. I wonder why. And uh, I never got an answer to that question. But uh, I wondered why. And then I, I, I never thought, I never thought that I would be there. I never thought that I would move. I never thought that I would come to a place like that. But let me tell you, I'm not saying a negative thing about Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That's not the point of this. But the point is, just like the Lord said, Elijah, Go to a place you never imagined. Go to a place where you didn't think of anything big there. Go to a place where you didn't think there was someone there to take care of you. I want you to go. I want you to go to Zarephath. You ever heard of that before? I want you to go to Zarephath. And there, there's somebody that's going to take care of you. That's where God's plan is. And then God called me to go to Harrisburg, and I said, Go where? <laughs> What are you talking about? And God said, yeah, I have something for you. I want to tell you a little story. And I was reading about a hymn that was written. We never probably heard the names Fred and Kitty Suffield. Fred and Kitty Suffield. And Fred is in his house one day in the middle of the night, and he hears a rap on the door, and he opens the door. It's the middle of the winter. It's freezing cold out. And a man says, hey, Fred, let me tell you something. There's a train over there. There's a train and there's a full of a bunch of people. They're about to freeze to death. The train has broken down the tracks, and these people are about to freeze to death. And Fred, being the man he was, a God, he actually didn't know the Lord at the time, but he opened his house and he let everybody come in. He said, everybody have a good night's sleep in this warm house. And this is Fred Suffield. And Fred and Kitty, uh, they, they were a couple who ended up later coming to know Christ as their Savior in Ontario, Canada. And they went to a church there and they came to know the Lord and they began, and they got under the ministry of a preacher whose last name was Shea. He was the preacher that they served under. And as they were under this ministry in Ontario, Canada, under Pastor Shea, as they were under this ministry, the Lord called them to evangelism. And uh, they were going to start traveling and, evan and go out into evangelism, but before they did that, this preacher had a young son who was a teenager who they wanted to help. Kitty and Fred wanted to help this young man. And his name was George Beverly Shea. How many of you have ever heard that name? Anybody? George Beverly Shea. And one time I saw his piano and I touched it and it took everything in my being not to play it. But George Beverly Shea was a son and Kitty and, and Fred said, we're going to take care of this young man. We're going to try to help him along in his Christian life. How many of you are thankful for people who help you along in your Christian faith? I'm thankful for those who took an interest in me, even though no one else did. The young people my age couldn't give a lick, excuse me, but that old preacher loved me and helped me. And those, that couple, they helped George Beverly Shea. And one day, George Beverly Shea, um, he decided he wanted to try to sing a song. And uh, Kitty, Kitty was a pianist, and she played the piano, all right? 
And uh, I love the piano. She played the piano. But she also wrote songs. And uh, Kitty had written this song, and I don't know which one it was at the time, but George Beverly Shea decided he wanted to sing. Now, he's only a teenager. All right? He's only a teenager. And he got up there to sing, and his voice cracked and sounded awful and terrible. He sat down, and he vowed and said, I will never sing again. And then Kitty, she said, no, no, no. I will have none of this nonsense. We'll just bring it down a little bit. We'll just sing a little lower. How about that? So she goes down and sings. And, and then she encouraged him, and he began singing and singing and singing and singing. And now all of us that know George Beverly Shea, the man who sung at all those Billy Graham crusades and was used of God to sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today, and was singing How Great Thou Art and these mighty hymns of the faith, and had such a rich, baritone, mighty, powerful voice. If there wasn't a woman named Kitty, he wouldn't be here today. He wouldn't be doing those things. A man who lived to be 99 years of age or so, who sung all those years, somebody helped him along. And I heard the story of how George Beverly Shea was singing at a meeting uh, with Billy Graham, and it was a smaller meeting with a bunch of churches. And you know the song that he sang when he's in his 90s, I believe? He sang this song that was written 73 years earlier by Kitty Suffield. And the song says, In the harvest fields now ripen, there's a work for all to do. And hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And the last verse says, does the place, now listen to these words, please. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and He'll not forget His own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Little is much when God is in it. And Elijah realized this is God's plan. It may not look like something big. It may not be somebody I know but little is much when God's in it. This is God's plan. How many of you want to be in God's plan? You want to be in God's plan? He arose. He immediately obeyed. By the way, when the Lord says, I want you to do something, you got to do it. <laughs> he arose and went. And then he finds a woman gathering sticks, and he says, bring me a little water in a vessel. And as she's walking away, he says, hey, wait a second. Give me a little cake to eat. Now, I love Elijah because not only did he, meet, he eat meat and he ate bread, but he also ate dessert. <laughs> a little cake, he said. I know, it's not really what it means, but I like to think it means that. <laughs> and he said, hey, lady, can you give me a cake? Some of y'all ladies here make some pretty good cake and brownies and all kinds of good things. And I just want to say, hold on a second, make me a little bit. And he said, Make me a little cake, too. Now, number one, God's plan. Number two, please write down the widow's plan. See, there's God's plan, that what He wants to do, and then there's the widow's plan. The Bible says in verse 12, and she said, as the Lord of God, the Lord thy God liveth. You see, He just asked her to bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand, not only water, but now bread. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a cruise. In a barrel, excuse me. And a little oil in a cruise. Now let me explain something to you. A barrel, a barrel, this is a small barrel, it's got a little bit at the bottom. You ever heard the, the expression, the bottom of the barrel? You ever heard that? The bottom, say, that's the bottom of the barrel, I don't want that. The bottom of the barrel. And a little oil in a cruise. And as I looked into this, and as I studied the word cruise, it's not talking about some big vat or something, but it's a little cup. Just a little cup. And in fact, the word actually means saucer. All right? Very small, just a little saucer of oil. Very, very little. She said, a handful? A handful. That's it. That's it. A handful of meal and a saucer of oil. You could put them together and make one little cupcake. All right? That's all you can make. What's the widow's plan? She said, and behold, I'm gathering two sticks. That means two branches to make fire. I believe is what that means. 
that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. You see, the woman had a plan. The woman said, I'm going to gather the last two branches that I can find in my yard. I'm going to bring them into the house. I'm going to make a fire. And we're going to use that fire to make this last little bit, this little handful and saucer of oil that we have together. We're going to use that fire to make a cake. We're going to eat it together. We're going to split that thing in half. He's going to eat one side. I'm going to eat the other. And then after that, we're going to die. That's what she said. That's it. We're going to die. And so this is the widow's plan. The widow's plan. We may eat it and die. So, see this second point. The widow's plan. Because she had an idea of what was going to happen. We all have plans, we say. Oh, I think this is going to go wrong. Oh, I think, as it's always been, this is going to happen. And we have it all planned out. But let me tell you something. God was about to bring the man of God along was about to change all your plans. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. Something I learned a while ago, and I'm still learning it, but God has taught me, God has taught me, that plans are subject to change, and they ought to be fluid, because God can change at any time. And when you hold on to those plans, and say, I want it this way, I want it this way, then it's going to be hard for you to relinquish that when God changes it. But here it is. The widow had a plan. We're going to die. We're going to eat this. That's it. Now, coming right along, God's plan. Number two, the widow's plan. Number three, notice please, the instructions. The man of God's instructions. We're coming right along. Coming right along. Putting it all together. Verse 13, And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me there of a little cake first, and bring it unto me and after me. And then after, make for thee and for thy son. In other words, he's saying, hey, I want you to take that, make it for me first. Now, it might sound a little selfish, doesn't it? But it only sounds selfish until you realize that Elijah knew what was going to happen. He said, I want you to, but here it is. Here's the important. Please don't miss this. I don't want to lose your attention. Please don't miss this. That the only way God's plan can be made sure and complete and full in your life is if you obey God's instructions. Because when you obey God's instructions, He can do what He wants to do. What if that widow said, no, I'm not going to do it that way? Then God would not have been able to provide all that she needed for many days. He wouldn't be able to provide that. The important part is the instruction. And the man of God said, the man of God who God had ordained to be the prophet of God, he says, hey look, here's what you need to do. You know, people sometimes say, hey, I'm struggling, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And then you tell them what to do, and they say, well, I don't want to do that. Hey, listen, that's what you got to do. you got to do exactly what God says. The instructions were very clear. Make it for me first. And if you do that, look at verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. He says, hey, look, if you do what I've said, there's a promise that that barrel of oil will not waste and that cruise of oil will not fail until God sends rain on the earth. And by the way, it's a wonderful thing when God sends the rain on the earth. It's a wonderful thing when God sends blessings into your life. It's a wonderful thing when the showers of blessing come. It's a wonderful thing when things start to work out. But things would not have worked out if she did not obey the instructions that God gave. She had to obey the instructions. So here it is. The widow's plan. Number three, the instructions of the man of God. Number four, we see the obedience of the widow. There's obedience. Verse 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. She went immediately and did what God said. And because she did it, she didn't do it her own way. She didn't say, no, I'm going to make it for me and my son, and then if I have any left over, I'll make it for you. But she did exactly what he said. Just make me a cake first. Make me some water first. And then, if you do the way I said, the prescribed succession of events, if you do exactly what I said, then the barrel of oil will not waste. The, bar the barrel of meal will not waste, and the cruise of oil will not fail. It will not happen if you obey. Here's what I'm saying to you today. 
you say, I don't think God's ever going to provide for me. I don't think He's going to sustain me. I don't think He's going to help me through this. I don't think He's going to do anything that I'm asking Him to do. I don't think He's going to do it. Well, He will only do it if you, in the meantime, will obey His instructions. You say, what are His instructions? It's called the Bible. The Bible gives us instructions. He says, this is the way you should live. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. And the Lord gives us what His will is, that we should know Him, the only true God. And His will, that we should walk circumspectly. And His will, that we should be filled with the Spirit. This is God's will for our lives. And if you follow God's will, please hear me, you can be certain, you can be 100% positive that God will sustain you in the drought. He will sustain you if you follow what His Word says and quit worrying about everything. We, we worry, well, will God sustain us? Will He sustain me? Will He sustain me? Let me ask you a question. Has He? Has God forsaken you? Will He sustain? Will He provide? But let me say something unequivocally that we must understand that if you stop obeying God and just doing everything your own way, then you may find yourself in a drought without sustenance because you've rejected the sustenance God gave. Let me ask you a question. We'll go to our final points. What if the widow woman said, no, I want to do it another way? And she would not have had the sustenance she needed. She would have been stuck in the drought. She would have been stuck for the rest of her life. And they would have died like they planned on it. They would have died if they didn't obey God's plan, God's instructions. Man of God's instructions, number four, the obedience of the widow. Number five, notice please, the fulfillment of God's promise. Aren't you glad that God's promises are always fulfilled? Always. I read promises all the time in the Word of God. I will never leave thee. All things work together for good. I see so many promises that the evil will not hurt you. He that dwelleth in the secret of the place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I read these promises that God gives in His Word and you can bank on it, as the preachers say. You can take it to the bank that God will fulfill it. Verse 16, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Hey, that is the key phrase, according to the word of the Lord. You and I might fail. I fail all the time. I failed this week a couple times. And you probably did too. But his word will not fail. Oh, my precious friends, please understand this. His word will not fulfill, will not fail. There's a fulfillment of God's promise. He said, look, if you obey me, it'll all work out. Some people say, oh, 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 yeah. Well, it's not working out for me. Are you obeying him? That's the question. Are you obeying him? If you are, he will sustain you. Okay, now we come to number six. We know the story. What happens when her son becomes sick? Here it is. Number six, we see the disappointment. Please write down the disappointment. There's a disappointment. After all, God had already provided, and for many days she's living there, and the man of God there, and her son, and they have everything they need. But one day her son gets sick. How many of you think that's a disappointment? Not only is he sick, but he's, the Bible says there's no, le there's no breath left in him. In other words, he died. She lost her son. And it's a tragic thing. So what does she do? She kind of lashes out at the man of God. She thinks, well, you must have done this. He fell sick and there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah in verse 18, what have I to do with thee, O that man of God? In other words, what are you doing? Did you kill my son? Art thou coming to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? You see, immediately she thought it was because of something wrong she did. And that is our response. Every time something bad happens, we think, oh, I did something wrong. No, that's not what happened here. God's glory was about to be made known. God was about to do an amazing thing. Hey, God might bring something in your life, a hard time or a disappointment. God might bring a disappointment into your life to purify you and to the glory of Himself and for your own better good. We'll find that this widow was better off at the end because she came to know the true God through this. 
She came to know through God, the true God, because of what God was going to do in raising her son. She came to know the Lord. And what I'm saying to you today is, yes, God can fulfill His promises, and then one day, all of a sudden, like a ton of bricks, something hits you, and it's a disappointment. And you're like, why, God, have I done something wrong? Why is all this happening? What's going on? What have I to do with you? But as you continue to obey the Lord, and God does a mighty work, then you realize God allowed it for a reason. There was a reason that this happened. A disappointment. And the prophet doesn't try to explain it. He doesn't say, hey, you listen, you ought to trust God. No, he just he says in verse 19, give me that son. Took him out of her bosom, carried him up to the loft where he was living, put him on his own bed. He just took, took him from her. And he cried unto the Lord and said, oh, Lord God, now he's asking questions too. Right? Hast thou also brought evil upon this widow through my sojourn by slaying her son? He's probably thinking, Lord, why would you allow this to happen? I'm trying to help this woman. And she's lost her son. How, how is this helping? And he stretched himself upon the child three times. He cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee to let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived, and Elijah took the child. So here it is. There's a disappointment. But then notice lastly, there's the restoration. There's a restoration. There's a restoration. There's a disappointment. Can I say something to you? Life is full of disappointments. There will be disappointments. But how do we deal with them? How do we respond to them? Do we say, God, what's wrong with you? Or do we say, maybe God's teaching me something. Maybe God's doing something. Disappointments, but there's a restoration. Here's the power of the story. The power of the story. The son was raised to life. Notice what he said. Verse 23. The child had revived. and His life came in again. Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. That was a glorious time. And Elijah said, See? <laughs> I son with it. In other words, what are you to worry about? Uh, you know? See? Thy son liveth. Thy son liveth. This is a restoration that came. The restoration of the son. She continued to Trust the Lord. And God provided it because she had been obedient. He restored that son. Have you lost something? Have you lost someone? Do you think you've lost someone? Does someone need to be restored? You keep obeying the Lord. Following the Lord. Let the Lord restore them. You see, we cannot restore them. I can't restore. There's a lot of people I want to restore. There's a lot of people I wish I could just bring them and just make them new. But that's foolishness. I can't do that. But as I obey the Lord and do what He wants me to do, God can restore. Now look at the last verse. The woman said to Elijah, now after all this had happened, the child's raised again. And the, and the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know. You see, please understand this. If you have, if any time you listen, just listen to this. By this I know, that means, listen, God had to make this disappointment happen in her life, had to allow this to happen so that she could say, by this I know that the Lord is God. This had to happen. And we don't understand some of the workings of God, His way in the great waters. We don't understand all that God does, but we know as He does these things in our lives. And He sustains us through them. Horrible disappointments and heartaches and He sustains us through them, then we know Him more than we've ever known Him before. Someone once said, God whispers to us in our pleasures and shouts to us in our pain. He whispers to us in our pleasures and He shouts to us in our pain. God's greatest way of speaking is through pain. Disappointment. When He does a great work, Here's what she says. And the woman said to Elijah, By this I know, now 
Now, by this I know, that thou art a man of God, that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. This is the kicker. This is the clutch of the whole thing. This is it. By this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. Can I say something to you? The word of the Lord is always true. The word, of the, Lord, the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Not because it came out of the man of God's mouth, but because it already proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's why it was true. Because the word of the Lord always in our mouth is true. And let me, as I close, right now, let me encourage you today. You say, I'm struggling or I have a disappointment or something has happened. And let me tell you today, the best thing, the best thing that you can do is begin learning to trust in the living, unchangeable, immutable, undying, and perfect, and powerful Word of God, and to trust that the Word of the Lord is always truth. It will always be truth. And you can trust. You say, I don't understand why God wants me to do this. I don't understand it all. Hey, well, let me tell you something. i got a newsflash. I don't either. But that doesn't change the fact that I am to obey God and what He has told me. And then I will discover, as I obey the Lord, that the word of the Lord in his mouth is true. Let me encourage you. What are you going to do when those things happen? You see, we're going to trust in God's word. It's always trustworthy. The word of the Lord in our mouth is always true. Always, always true. Trust in it. God has a plan. You may have a plan. But what do you need to do? You need to obey God's plan need to be obedient to it and what He has for you. And then you'll see the fulfillment of the promise. When the disappointment comes, don't get disheartened, but trust and know He will restore. What is it that needs to be restored? 30 seconds and we're praying. What is it in your life, in my life, that needs to be restored? Is it someone? Is it something? Is it my relationship with God? Is it your relationship with God? What is it? It needs to be restored. Go to the Lord in prayer. Go to the Word of God. Say, by God's grace, I don't want to obey my plan anymore, but I want to obey, I want, I want to obey God's plan. Be obedient to Him and know that in the end, I'll, I'll just know with all my heart, the Word of the Lord is truth. Let's bow in prayer together, maybe.